Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and also the colleague, uh, Dr. Hao Dongxu. And he got uh, his MD PhD in Sozo Medical College, uh, the Medical College of Sozo University. But uh, he started his uh, professional training here in the Middle West and did uh, his uh, postdoc in, at the Washington University. And uh, immediately he started an uh, interesting track, I think it's a, it combined it's a medical scientist program, combined AP and the research. And then he did a fellowship in a great institution, but not, now it's not exist in the AFIP. And wow. for the pulmonary and the media standard pathology. And then he joined University of Rochester and that has a very fast track of arising from assistant professor to full professor and, and also directs the head neck pathology and pulmonary pathology in University of Rochester. And then he moved to UCS, UCLA to direct the head and neck pathology there. Now he's in the University of Washington to direct the head and neck and, and also pulmonary and cardiac pathology. And he, he, his career is interesting. I think it's something I try to move to because I become a faculty and then try to do, get my research study in 2008. At times, it's really difficult to get a funding. So he, he after he got his faculty position, he immediately got a KO8, and then now so as our, our one funded. So he has a very robust basic science research program. But also, if you look at his CV, he published everything in pathology from the skin all the way to different organs. <laughs> and he's an expert even in melanoma as a pulmonary pathologist. <laughs> OK. I, I, think, I think if you, I mean, if you're interested in an academic career, he's probably the one you can get advice from him. He has not go through that. Now he reviews the KO8 program for NIH Heart Long Blood Institute. So he can, he, I can give you some insight. But every time you write an email or send his case, he's going to get an answer back right away. And the resident, we're going to learn how he approached the cases. I think it, it, it's, it, he has a good way to to, to approach each case and give you a differential. So I think one time when the people from University of Washington ask people at UCA how he is, everyone say, I even showed a case to him. So then he, they hired him right away and say, there must be a good pathologist if you ever especially show cases to him. Right? So now please welcome Dr. Shu. It's uh, great to be here, actually. Thanks, uh, Dr. Fa Chen Li's uh, uh, invitation. Yeah, he was my long time, actually, co like colleague in University of Rochester. Also, we developed lots of collaboration in research, particularly in beta catenin cigarette pathway involving ion channel regulation. Basically, we adapted lots of models he de developed in his lab. Right now, basically, we use that kind of model to determine how beta catenin so activation involving cardiac ion channel regulation underlying cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, today, actually, I'm going to share with you some uh, more detailed, like a uh, lung cancer classification. Also, share with you how we need to adapt the AJCC eighth uh, lung cancer staging. Uh, 2011, I c actually I joined that uh, lung. Adding a carcinoma classification meeting in New York because of Dr. William Travis. He was my mentor, he invited me to join that uh, classification. I know that when something uh, become, became new, always some you have, uh, you know, uh, agree, yes, or kind of say disagree. But if you cross the American different institutes, but a majority institutes is a it's a pretty good, at least in some way improve some like uh, classification to very helpful to treat the patients. Particularly, we believe um, prior classification actually we over treat the patient. But uh, after the the, 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 the the this new classification, basically we consider actually that that the treatment become become much much less aggressive less aggressiveness based on the new classification. So, so I'm going to uh, give uh, two portions uh, uh, talk. First portion will cover how we can classify lung adenocarcinoma. 
particularly based on the 2011 uh, new classification proposed by International uh, Lung Cancer Adenocarcinoma Classification Society. Then talk about uh, how to define the squamous cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, something can relate to weight uh, interest in neuroendocrine tumor. Also, some new information actually beyond the 2015 WHO classification. Always new things based on the research progress, progressiveness, then always new something uh, beyond the original classification. We'll discuss several cases uh, as well. Then talk about um, uh, AJCC is addition uh, staging because they will be effective in next year, January. Uh, it's very important for us to understand some new classification, particularly uh, invasive components of uh, uh, lung cancer in the background of a uh, lipid growth pattern, how we define the tumor invasion. That's mm -hmm. important. Talk about uh, prolate invasion, talk about uh, different tumor nodules, so how we can define this as uh, uh, one tumor or another separate tumor or intrapulmonary <coughs> metastasis. Me metastasis. So, First, actually, 2015 WHO basically adapted 2011 lung adenocarcinoma classification. Particularly, they talk about uh, pre uh, pre precursor of invasive tumor, talk about a typical uh, adenomatous hyperplasia, then talk about adenoma, uh, AIS, adenocarcinoma in situ. That's a kind of pretty like uh, amazing um, kind of a concept, replace the uh, BAC probably bronchial alveolar carcinoma. Basically, we never use that uh, BAC, the terminology, anymore. Then the new term actually called minimally invasive adenocarcinoma because both minimally invasive adenocarcinoma and adenocarcinoma in situ, they have patients basically have very, very wonderful uh, uh, outcome. So that's why we need to separate the two separate adenocarcinoma in situ as well as the minimal invasive adenocarcinoma. Before, if minimal invasive adenocarcinoma actually based on tumor size, you know, because uh, the three centimeter, so that's kind of uh, uh, in the new stage and we're totally different, we're discussing later. So we define basically uh, adeno, uh, AH based on the size of the uh, lesion. So as you can see, this is less than 0 0.5 centimeter, but like uh, alveolar architecture is preserved, aligned by this atypical uh, pneumocytes. That's what we consider, this is uh, uh, AH. Then if this is more than three centimeter, also less than, uh, more than uh, 0 0.5 centimeter, but less than three centimeter, without the invasion components, including like decimal plus reaction, just uh, including vascular or pro invasion, or new concept, I think uh, it's a very tough determinant spread through the air airway spaces. You have, you have tumor, so this is the scatter of the tumor nest, it's kind of adjacent to the main tumor. How can I define that cause spread through air space, not due to the carryover from the adjacent space? I think this will be more like uh, literature comes out about this issue. But overall, this tumor, like uh, uh, clinical outcome, very good, 100% uh, disease-free survival. So as the defin definition, so this is alveolar architecture basically preserved, right? This alveolar space is, you know, this is a safety aligned by this atypical uh, epithelial proliferation but without any kind of dysmoplasty reaction. Only the issue we have, I think if you pay attention, I was involved in that study in modern pathology. So we have like a 25 uh, international pulmonary pathologists that contribute, each one contribute five cases. So if I consider this is a uh, adenocarcinoma inside you with any kind of typical invasion, so that's uh, even Dr. William Travis, they, if he agreed or not. Even we have 25% in the like, pulmonary pathology during that kind of study. Particular case like this one, everybody agrees that this is the adenocarcinoma in situ, tumor less than three centimeters. But some cases, septal a little thick, how can you define this invasion or not? So that's kind of some controversial. Still some we have like 50, 55% discordant rate, pretty high. So 
in nowadays we emphasize about subspecialist sign out. That's a very critical, I believe, in a long in a long way. Also, in nowadays about uh, frozen. Frozen diagnosis in some institutes, particularly when I was in UCLA, right? So they ask us to do frozen, determine this is a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma in situ. It's a very challenging because, but we established that like, mutual trust. So potentially I may kind of miscall that. I frozen, I call it minimally invasive adenocarcinoma based on one representative section of section, right? The invading, oh, I say less than 0 0.5 centimeter. But because that's what I said, actually they only did the wedge resection, and they only, they did not do lymphadenous dissection. That's probably guideline will be published soon for the surgeons. Right now closer to America, basically exactly different surgeons have a different approach about this ground glass, the legion. Based on the radiology, oh, this is most likely adenocarcinoma in situ. Then they do wet, then ask us for uh, people to determine this is invasive or not, because they will take a different approach. Because all these patients, if uh, they have a ground glass, usually they have multiple nodules, ground glass in the different lobes, right? But uh, they are going to do lobectomy or not. Some surgeons say, let's say, because you call adenocarcinoma, go ahead to do adenine lobectomy with the extensive like liver nodes dissection, staging. But that's not the right approach because this patient usually is a separate lesions in different lobes, right? After which, we try to preserve the lung. So you say, if a patient have delivered this is nodule, another nodule will come next year, what are you going to do? Look back time, look back with no lung, actually. So that's critical, I think, in the future. So we talk about uh, uh, mucinous and non-mucinous adenocarcinoma side. You pre period Previous case basically is non-mucinous. As you can see, this is a actually mucinous epithelial lining. This is a mus basically mucinous adenocarcinoma in situ. But this kind of case is very rare if you compare with the uh, non-mucinous uh, uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. So we talk about minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Basically, I emphasize again here, the whole legion supposed lipidic growth pattern less than three centimeters. Only the issue we have, why did, why did you define three centimeter as cut off? Because I had a question too, when I kind of uh, uh, proposed a, posed a question to the panels in the US CAP meeting, for example, hey, Dr. Travis, how, why did you design the three centimeter? Because there's no much of scientific data. Basically, what they say based on their experience. So if more than three centimeter tumor, basically majority of cases are invasive. So basically, if more than three centimeter, so we cannot call this minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Only say, this is in the background of lipid growth pattern, then you try to find the invasive components. That invasive defines, say, less than 0 0.5 centimeter. So that's kind of, uh, because clinical outcome, very good. How can I de de determine the invasive components, right? Any, like, uh, other like uh, subtype pattern, including acina, papery, mi micropapery, solid pattern, that's all automatically considered consider to be invasive component, but it, except like lipid growth pattern. So how about the, 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 the so we have to exclude this possibility. So, or if the tumor basically invades the lymphatic blood vessel spaces, as I said, uh, like a spread to airway spaces, although this kind of debatable, but you have to consider that to, to be invasive right now. Prora, no prora evasion. So suppose no ne necrosis. Suppose, as I said again, no spreads through the airspace. <coughs> basically, if existing existence, this one basically it's, an, it's not like a diagnosis of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. So as I can see, can you see this one actually is a frozen case we had. So this is all like a lipid growth pattern of uh, adenocarcinoma, right? But only one area, did you see, this is a uh, uh, AOS space, uh, avular architectures are distorted, all kind of scar tissue with uh, acina glandular infiltrates. So that's basically minimally invasive adenocarcinoma because this size is less than 0 0.5 centimeter. So that's kind of critical. So I remember this case, uh, we signed us in, we favor minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Basically, they only did like a wedge, they stopped surgery. So 
Then talk about uh, invasive adenocarcinoma. If you compare with uh, like uh, older version of the WHO classification, you will say exactly we don't talk about the BSA anymore, bronchial alveolar carcinoma. So that's, uh, that terminology is very obscure. It's very difficult to quite understand any invasive components there, how much uh, invasive components there. Basically, we don't use anymore BAC. Uh, also, in this classification, you see invasive component lipidic as in a papery, micro solid. So you can you, you must not see like uh, what, what, what are the clear cell carcinoma, for example, not exist in the new WHO, right? So well, you, as you can see, because why they delete that classification? What they say, if we look at case, cases by cases, you always find maybe some area you have signaling to ring cells uh, or clear cells. So basically, that basically not like a representative of, of clinical outcome. So that's basically invasive components uh, of the adenocarcinoma. We talk about sub subclassification subclassifica of lung adenocarcinoma. We talk about lipidic pred predominant, predominant adenocarcinoma. Basically, <coughs> Whatever that tumor size, let's say all lipidic growth pattern, this is alveolar architecture preserved line by this atypical cells, you have some invasive components. This inf invasive component should be more than whatever components. Is this. If this is more than zero, three centimeter, right? We usually don't call like a lipid, uh, lipidic growth. Uh, uh, we don't call like a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. If even this is uh, like a less than. 0.5 centimeter. But this case, tumor actually 9 centimeter, 8 centimeter, then you have 1.1 centimeter. This is what we call lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma because the patient, the clinical outcome is very good. So this is what we talk typically pattern called S in the pattern, right? So you have glandular infiltrates, no kind of lipidic growth pattern we see here. Architecture basically distorted, easy to uh, recognize this uh, S in the adenocarcinoma. This is a typical papillary adenocarcinoma, particularly for first year resident. How can I define this is papillary adenocarcinoma, not a micro papillary carcinoma, right? How to define this? This is typically papillary structures, right? You have uh, a typical cell surrounding central connective tissue. This is malignant cell. This is called papillary. If you compare papillary PTC, papillary thyroid carcinoma, it's easy to recognize this papillary architecture. A micro papillary, you have a kind of a uh, atypical or malignant epithelial surrounding central actually no tissue. So you have like a plurality of the epithelial pattern, but you don't have connected tissue inside. This is a micro papillary. So you have to understand, let's say again, this is you have micro papillary, right? Here, this is small nesting, but it still preserves the plurality of the uh, epithelial cell lining, right? So this is the area some you have as in a pattern. WHO required as to report, say, predominant pattern, how much percentage of the tumor. For example, this one, 70% uh, as in a predominant, then you have 30% kind of micropapillary carcinoma. So each, they require as to give, say, 5% of 5 incremental uh, components. You have 5%, let's say, 5% of solid components here. You have added in your report. However, it depends on the institute's uh, to deal with this, you, you want to add it or not. So probably it's not a scientific way because it kind of all, it's very arbitrary. I say 5%, you may say 10%. However, if you put the data in your database in the future, easy to collect the data for your research, because I know this is some component solid to micro papillary in your report, easy to find out the uh, case for long-term studies. So this is, for example, this is acinal predominant. So that you have some lipidic growth pattern. You say 60% like a predominant acinal growth pattern. You have lipidic growth pattern. This is all from the um, resect, resection specimen. Now how can I sign out, let's say, small needle core biopsy, right? So needle core biopsy, if you only have lipidic growth pattern, we just say adenocarcinoma with uh, lipidic growth pattern because Two five centimeter, the only got a needle core biopsy. We cannot exclude any invasive components there, right? So needle core biopsy is very different from the wedge resection or lobectum specimen diagnosis. All this classification based on resected specimen, not based on needle core biopsy. So this is a, as you can see, I talk about uh, this all like a micro papillary. 
why do we need to separate a micropapillary adenocarcinoma? As you know, in different organs, if you find the micropapillary carcinoma, overall patient's uh, cl clinical outcome is uh, worse, right? So basically, they have more infiltrating lymph nodes involved, et cetera. So any micropapillary carcinoma, you have to report it in your report, even in the needle core biopsy. So any micropapillary, any solid components in your needle core biopsy, you have to report it. Because micropapillary carcinoma and a solid adenocarcinoma, they are poorly differentiated. Right now we consider. As in a papillary, we consider moderately differentiated. But although the truly grading system has not been proposed, always based on like a, a, some paper studies. So this is how to de determine this is solid adenocarcinoma. So solid adenocarcinoma, like based on WHO, you have to either TTF1, nepsin a positivity. So that's a basic adenocarcinoma marker. Or if this is the two marks that are negative, then you have to do mucin staining. So mucin coming will highlight the intracytoplasmic mucin. Uh, you have to consider positivity. If extracellular mucin positivity, you cannot consider they are positive staining, okay? So also you have defined like a definition, say you have to say five cells containing cytoplasmic mucin staining per two high power fields. That's important. So some of you probably question why did you determine that they, they, they use two uh, high, prior, you know, high, high power field, why you just use five or whatever. So basically that's kind of experts decide. I don't think they have 100% for sure the scientific data, but you have to define something for somebody to follow up, right? So this right now basically define this adenocarcinoma. Either way, TDF1 or nepsin A positive. Or this, if this negative have forced you to do mucin staining. If mucin staining positive, I said to define say two, uh, five cells containing cytoplasmic mucin per two high power fields, then you can consider this solid adenocarcinoma because that will be different from the large cell carcinoma classification we'll mention, discuss later. So we talk about the mucinous uh, uh, adenocarcinoma. As you can see, this is all mucin poor, then with kind of invasive components, this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma. This is different from the mucinous kind of lipidic growth pattern. Right, so this is all mucin poor floating up. This is the tumor cells. You have invasive components. Truly non-mucinous adenocarcinoma, like a non-invasive one. It's very rare. If you have the case, you will submit all tumors, or you usually you will find the invasive components. It's very rare. But you have some variants. You have the you know have a colloid type. This right now we don't call like a sister adenocarcinoma. We can say a sister adenocarcinoma also is a colloid carcinoma. So you have some theta type uh, adenocarcinoma. You have enteric uh, type of adenocarcinoma. Enteric type uh, adenocarcinoma. When we have a biopsy or even resection specimen, certainly we can do immunostains. However, immunostains is not a standard to diagnose enteric. Uh, adenocarcinoma on the lung, you have to uh, raise the possibility of this metastatic from GI tract, to, right? Because even let's say TTF1 positive, we have found like a 5% of GI tract, particularly colon cancer, TTF1 can be positive. Or depends, you have two clones of TTF1. By the way, as you like say, you will be new faculty to each lab, right? When I say went to, already I'm just two months ago, I went to University of Washington. First thing I have to no, you have a bunch of antibodies. I have to know each specific clone you, you have, right? So because TDF1, which is more like a high specific or low specific, I have to know. Because in that way, I know how to interpret the antibodies. So as you know, the TDF1 can be positive in lung cancer, right? Can be positive in the GI, GI tract, can be positive in like a GYN tumor too. So you have to think about it. even nepsin A, for example, nepsin A. Everybody consider lung adenocarcinoma, but can be positive in the thyroid cancer, can be positive in the papillary renal cell carcinoma, even can be positive in clear cell adenocarcinoma of the GYN tumor. So basically, when you read in literature, always the first publication. Oh, this is too, this mark is very specific, but with the more studies, more studies, you will see actually less specific. So actually, as you can see, this is our publication in 2011. Before that, we already 
kind of recognize the pattern as well because you have see, even I use some pictures to use my presentation in this uh, human pathology paper. So this is a, a tip, uh, AH, that's adenocarcinoma in situ, two, Mus non mucinous, this is a kind of uh, mucinous, as in a pattern, more differentiated, like, you know, kind of pep, uh, as in a pattern, solid pattern. That time, basically, we pay more attention about RNA binding protein, I IMP3, because we saw this IMP3 kind of be representative of progressiveness of the tumor, say more rate differential or typically sorted growth pattern of tumor, more like a positive for this is a tumor. So basically kind of uh, uh, we just recognize that, that time also we kind of contributed this field as well. So let's move on to the squamous cell carcinoma for example. So right now basically they classify three subtypes characterizing, non-characterizing Particularly non characterizing we need to do immunostains, P40 or CK56 positive, and then TDF1 or nepsin A negative, we call non characterizing Based on literature so far, they consider this is two separate type tumors. Basically, they don't have uh, exactly clinical significance, uh, clinical outcome for this kind of tumor. But the, the, based on morphology, we can talk about the characterizing and the non characterizing Little kind of different from the head neck tumor. I believe in the hand neck tumor, non characterizing squamous cell carcinoma, more aggressive than characterizing squamous cell carcinoma. Then, do you think we have uh, some category basaloid squamous cell carcinoma, easy to be confused with uh, like a small cell carcinoma and uh, other type of cancer? We often do immunohistochemical uh, like stains. P40 usually positive, usually both TDF1 neuroendocrine markers negative for basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. That's uh, kind of critical. So sometimes, by the way, small cell carcinoma, it's very tricky. In very rare cases, they can be P63. Even I had a case recently, P40 is positive. But although this is not a written in WHO, kind of uh, you have to think about uh, all the differential diagnosis, particularly when you have a small blue cell tumor uh, in your diagnosis. Yeah, that's the reason that we, with Dr. Lee, uh, the kind of uh, 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 review. <coughs> Particularly, we emphasize by, about the biomarkers uh, applied in the uh, lung cancer and the pleural tumors. Um, actually, I involve uh, several residents uh, because I like to work with my residents. Actually, during my, particularly in my junior stage of uh, my uh, development stage, my faculty member, I actually help like uh, uh, my residents to write lots of papers. Actually, um, it's uh, kind of important. Also, kind of if I. Kind of, I feel always that when I write the paper, I will be expert in that field. So that's a kind of, kind of I kind of take like attitude. So yeah, as probably when I was like, uh, I had like a K8, I did not have much time in the clinic, but I do have some time working in science, writing this kind of paper, also kind of significantly improved my diagnostic skills. Also, I feel as a you are physician scientist, if you don't do good job in the clinical part, don't do science. Because if you say go to every day I can assign the case, ask uh, you know, other people's help. Or in the frozen, oh, I can handle uh, because I'm, I'm doing science, but uh, not, don't do science. So you, if you want to do science, you have to get your good job done like in clinical part. So this is the way we always uh, talk about uh, uh, how we separate, uh, separate like uh, from squamous cell carcinoma to adenocarcinoma. We often you use the panel staining. Uh, sometimes we'll say we have tough cases, for example, even this case, for example, oh, this is uh, all like a sheets of uh, eosinophilic uh, monogamous cells proliferation. You compare this with that. Sometimes we have tough, this is adeno or squamous. Why do we need to separate the squamous from the adenocarcinoma? Several reasons, right? Well, if you die in adenocarcinoma, we automatically send the tissue for uh, molecular tests, so probably different institutes uh, have a different uh, policy. At the UCLA, for example, whatever needle core biopsy you diagnose non-squamous cell carcinoma, uh, can lung cancer, automatically to do all the six gene uh, molecular tests, then to fish, you do ALK1, you have to do RAS1. So basically, whatever you, st we, even we don't know the clinical staging. We already cut from, let's say we all got the biopsy, right? We say clinically suspected mass, even say lung needle core biopsy, we already cut like uh, spare the slides there, prepare for 
uh, molecular tests and translocation studies. Probably consider this is too much waste, right? Because even this we call benign, right? So they, this kind of slide will be kind of garbage, right? But I mean, so as an institute, you see, people always can say, oh, I'm a kind of a, uh, like institutes, right? We have established reputation. So we have tried to get the turnaround time because you have molecular di diagnosis has tried to have a report for uh, medical oncologists within seven days. Because the, se the, the patient after needle call vest, they see medical oncologists. They want to see what, uh, what your status of EGFR, what's the status of alcat well. So it's kind of important to make a decision how to uh, determine the approach of these patients, right? So this is kind of another thing, why do we need to determine this squamous of any carcinoma? So as a medical oncologist, we know the squamous cell carcinoma based on clinical trial, right? We usually do not uh, prescribe uh, a vaccine. Uh, a vaccine is a, a vas vascular uh, inhibitors, right? So if you prescribe a vaccine to the patients with squamous cell carcinoma, they can have a hemorrhage, right? Because the patient could be died of the hemorrhage. So because you have to think about why I need to separate from adenine from squamous. For example, another um, preacher may say, I think that can only can, you, can be used for adenine carcinoma. It's not used for in the squamous cell carcinoma. But I think also as a pathologist, you think about, say, when I diagnose this, then how the medical oncologist, how surgeons, you know, take different approaches maybe, right? So our diagnosis is very important. So we know diagnose small cell carcinoma, non-small cell carcinoma, critical, right? But nowadays, even in some cases, like uh, you have adenine carcinoma component, squamous cell car carcinoma component. <laughs> if I send, say adenine squamous, I may get a phone call saying, what's the com percentage of adenine components there? What's the percentage of squamous cell carcinoma there? Then you may say that you're crazy because it's very difficult for me to say, but uh, for them, it gets a big deal, right? You say adenine may be converted different, more, they may use a different combining, like uh, agents, right? So kind of, uh, it is important, by the way. So another thing we talk about, large cell carcinoma. Large cell carcinoma, I think, kind of, uh, if you want to be exist, maybe exist, if you don't want to, the, the uh, large cell carcinoma not exist, or kind of, it may not be exist, but when I talk to experts, right? But right now, WHO 2015 have a three kind of definition. If uh, like immunohistochem, basically you have cytokine positive, right? Large cell carcinoma, it's uh, without a small cell carcinoma morphology, without adenoglandular, without squamous differentiation, right? Without a neuroendocrine morphology, too. You, you need to think about could it be larger cell carcinoma. But you have to do immunosense, let's say TDF1, nepsin A negative, or P40, CK5, CK negative. That's basically called non-IHC staining pattern, right? Well, another unclear IHC pattern, right? For example, TDF negative, I have small focus of P40 or P63 or CK56 positivity. So you cannot diagnose that squamous cell carcinoma. You have to consider this larger cell carcinoma. So now, that's kind of, I disagree, use this kind of terms in the WHO classification. They say no additional stains. What's that mean? So, so don't perform immunostain, just a direct call, larger cell carcinoma. I don't think that's, a, but anyway, they have kind of, um, say, non-additional -addition, stains. But certainly, uh, I mentioned again, you have to do mucin. You, if you say no positive TDF1 or P40, then you have to do mucin stain, exclude the solid adenocarcinoma pattern. So we'll talk about uh, neuroendocrine a tumor as a kind of that, the 2015 WHO classification, they already take this large cell neuron carcinoma from the large cell carcinoma category, put it in the uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors. So when we have a tumor, you have to think about, if you see the neuroendocrine morphologist, then go ahead to do immunostains, right? So as you know, like say, non-small cell lung adenocarcinoma, non-small cell carcinoma, probably 30% these tumors can be positivity for synaptophysin, even chromogranin CD56. No neuroendocrine morphologists don't diagnose neuroendocrine tumors, right? So that's kind of, if you diagnose, uh, like I say, I have an adenocarcinoma, probably you guys have received the cancer case from the uh, small institutes. Maybe they did a bunch of immunos, then you have synaptophysin positivity, it looks at adenocarcinoma. So, so what? I usually don't put the diagnosis with the neuroendocrine differentiation. Two terminologies, neuroendocrine morphology, neuroendocrine differentiation. There's two different terminology. 
neuroendocrine neuro morphology, you have seen, like say, rosette pattern, nuclear parasitin, tro uh, trabecular nests. That's the way we talk about neuroendocrine neuro morphology. Neuroendocrine differentiation based on the neuroendocrine markers. WHO recommends three markers, right? It's uh, synaplasmicin, uh, chromogranin, and CD56. We, we don't use it like an NSE, non specific, right? So, uh, in this neuroendocrine tumor, we only emphasize the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. You need to have an immunohistochemical staining, either like one, at least one of them positivity, or you can do EM to see like uh, neuroendocrine granules there. So that's kind of a larger cell neuron carcinoma. Only this one, small cell carcinoma, you don't need to have immunostains to make a diagnosis. But if you have immunostains, you probably feel comfortable to diagnose this. Let's say how we can, sometimes we have trouble, right? To diagnose, you have probably say, let's say all have, we have neuroendocrine features, how to separate this carcinoid. You have typical, atypical, small cell from larger cell neuron carcinoma. So we have this kind of typical carcinoid. So based on mitosis, uh, the enum called punctate necrosis. This is based on you know all our studies before. So, <coughs> but at WHO, so you have de detailed classification. Let's say more than two mitotic activity, you have you cannot call typical carcinoid. That's a typical carcinoid. You say you have some my, the punctate necrosis. That's a typical carcinoid, right? So usually small cell carcinoma versus large cell neuron carcinoma, we all have trouble. But my I believe that. Don't just be like a based on the tumor size. That's kind of very objective. So based on current definition, individual tumor cells, you have uh, less than three mature lymphocytes. Then you can, oh, this is small cell carcinoma. As like a Jeff, Dr. Jeff Myers from Michigan, probably a very famous lung uh, pulmonary pathologist. If you look more careful, careful in the small cell carcinoma, you always probably find some area larger cell neuron carcinoma. If you feel this is all, all overall is small cell carcinoma, just the call small cell carcinoma. But the, the treatment right now actually have an issue. Different states may use a different kind of approach. Uh, some, let's say, if like a small cell in peripheral, actually the user can do wet, right? So after that, they do chemo. Some, like say, larger cell neuron carcinoma, Maybe in the after the resection, maybe you use the similar protocol to small cell carcinoma as well. <laughs> so I think still we don't have a kind of a, um, right exactly guideline how exactly treat the small cell carcinoma from different from the uh, larger cell neuron carcinoma. Basically, small cell carcinoma we know, but it means uh, how do we treat the larger cell neuron carcinoma? Still kind of debatable. Usually, they are do resection after chemo. What kind kind of chemo agent? use similar to the non-small cell carcinoma or to use this uh, uh, small cell carcinoma. Some institutes just use the agent of small cell carcinoma to treat the uh, lung, large cell neuron carcinoma. I'll quickly talk about uh, beyond the 2015 classification of uh, lung cancer. When talk called creepiform pattern of uh, uh, lung adenal carcinoma, we often see this pattern in the breast, for example. It's exactly truly creepiform. You have uh, uh, this is creepiform. You have back bath of grains. So you have little associated with solid components. This is a, a creepiform pattern. Right now, it's not written in the 2015 class, uh, WHO classification. But probably five, uh, four percent of uh, whole of lung uh, adenocarcinoma. They have four percent. It is a kind of tip typical pattern. When you try to isolate this as an independent pattern, you can say, what's, what, 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 what do you mean? So this is all independent clinical outcome or not. As you can see, the creepiform pattern, based on Dr. Chaffee's group, they did a study. Just uh, separate this group. What do you say creepiform pattern, actually, patients who actually do worse than other asina in a papillary pattern? You see this one, this here. So basically, they will consider this is independent uh, pattern, I believe, next to the like, WHO classification, is going to uh, classify the creepiform pattern in the subclassification. We have a few cases with bone mats, actually. So then talk about, this is the new one, easy to make a mistake. You know, ciliate, called ciliated muconodular papillary uh, tumor of the lung. So it's a kind of to say ciliated mucus because if this tumor is a papillary structure, mucin poor, you have basal cell lining. So this probably gives some 
people's impression this power is a metaplastic chain. But more actually, it's the, the, the uh, molecular test actually found the mutation in this kind of cancers, in this kind of tumor. Basically, WHO do not, does not know how to classify this tumor. So it's not in the WHO yet. So it's not AKT1. Recently, they found the mutation, particularly BIF, you have two subtypes of mutation. You have EGFR, EGFR mutation, which is different from uh, mm -hmm. those uh, uh, seen in the lung adenocarcinoma. But it's, uh, at least uh, this kind of tumor has a uh, majority cases of mutations. Sorry, if you could go back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if uh, the, the, the top two... Uh, yeah, top two histology. I, I wonder if many of the pathologists in the room would call this adenocarcinoma, wouldn't you? Yeah, probably not. Uh, but uh, during frozen, you may have a trouble. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, if this case, then question probably, you all figure out what should I call, right? So probably descriptive, let's say, kind of uh, like a uh, kind of, uh, if I sign a case, probably I favor metaplastic change, right? And then question is, say, because you have more, more molecular tests, because this kind of mutation there, this is, uh, it is truly near plastic or not. Everybody consider like kind of near plastic process. But uh, all these patients have very good outcome. So then it all depends on how to put this one in the, in, the, in the category. On a frozen section, it would be a problem. Yeah, you have to think about it. Basically, I would say, oh, probably mucinous, mucinous adenocarcinoma, right? Sometime, if you had not an extensive uh, section yeah. to review, you did not see clearly, say, oh, basal, say, a P yeah, because in the permanent, you would do, let's say, do P63, any like a basal CLC, a paper highlight, right? So that's just kind of uh, need to think about that in your differential diagnosis. So another one, for example, the new probably if you go to the literature, talk about a SMAC4, BIG1, kind of uh, deficient adenocarcinoma. So this particular morphology probably like drive you to study a little bit because you see this is kind of typical pattern, larger cells, then you have inflammatory infiltrates. This cell sometimes clear cytoplasma with eosinophilia in the cytoplasma. And yes, this cell is a neutrophilic infiltrates. You know, so some, some cells you have basal-like you know, bodies here, basophilic bodies. Then you have some glandular differentiation. Then you have reptoid. But this is a particular this feature to do immunosystem. Just recently, the paper 2017, I reviewed this one. So you see, this is basically, you say, some haploid carcinoma patterns, right? You have some HEPA1, even you have AFP, glipkins 3, and the SAL4. This kind of positivity here. But you do have SMAC4, basically it's uh, uh, like, you know, negativity due to the gene deletion or truncation. You have the background stroma cell, inflammatory cell, they preserve this uh, SMAC4. SMAC2, basically they say decrease, but uh, it's uh, difficult to judge, to judge and make uh, this kind of uh, uh, degree, uh, intensity of staining. So basically finishing that uh, adding the, the carcinoma classification, also including other uh, subtype cancers classification. Let's quickly move on to the uh, staging. So staging kind of important, right? It's uh, everybody knows if you depends that the, your staging, they will give different uh, uh, treat approach treat to treatment, treat the patient, right? Also provides clinical yeah, out in information outcome, predict the patient's the survival rate. So as you can see, this is uh, actually. Uh, overall, the, the, the lung cancer staging, particularly has lots of change because the T change. So then also a, M actually add M1C. I will f give you further detail. Usually de determine the tumor size. That's important, right? Then you have the tumor adjacent structure, for, for example, vasoprolar involvement or not, right? So with the cancer spread to the lymph node, or this is a cancer metastatic to uh, distant organs or not. So that's a major classification. So probably so oh yeah, easy, just on tumor, based on tumor size, I make a T, right? So it's not that simple right now because you have to think about if this lipidic growth predominant pattern that you have invasive, you have to consider invasive components to determine the T, not your whole tumor. That's a major concept, I think, in this uh, new staging. Just very important, for example, you, you have like a, a five centimeter of the tumor, right? Then all repeated growth, growth pattern, you have 
1.1 centimeter of the invasive, only based on 1.1 centimeter invasive component to stage in this patient. That's kind of very critical. We'll discuss a little bit later. So based on this is the tumor size, you can also T1. So another change a little bit, the bronchus less than two centimeter actually per, per, prior away it's more, you know, kind of uh, from T3, T4, they change actually. Also, we say the total pneumonectomy, if this is you have pneumonitis, be before actually called, they're actually pre pretty aggressive, then they decrease the, uh, the, the staging. So, et cetera, this kind of uh, end staging was not changed, but uh, kind of subtle change because you have different nodes involved, but the overall not uh, uh, affect the staging. They add like an M1C, or depend different organs involved, single nodule or two nodules, uh, actually different organs, they determine this is a, a, a M1C. So how, how can we do staging, lymphatic staging, based on the like, uh, criteria, they say you have to at least uh, submit like uh, six lymph nodes for staging, at least uh, three lymph nodes from mediastinal lymph nodes. So that's important that you can complete staging, but certainly we don't do that kind of uh, strictly because even they put the staging, which just gave us lymph node to staging. But overall, you have to consider mediastinal nodes are very important, right? Single digit lymph nodes, uh, mediastinal lymph nodes, uh, kind of N2, right? Two digits lymph nodes, like for example, uh, N11, that's like, no, so lymph nodes 11 stage, you have uh, N1, right? So, Race the, in, the, in the new class and the staging system about uh, micro metastasize and isolate tumor cell like a breast right now. So basically, uh, exactly how we're going to approach actually probably depends on institutes. You know, dip, dip, you have to discuss in your multidiscipline conference to decide, say this is let's say more than, like say 0.2 millimeter. Probably it's a micro metastasis you consider mad. How about isolator here, they say PN01 plus. So basically, kind of uh, how the exact address into mutual like among different group of people to understand to the to the approach. So talk about the plural involvement is important. Why with the plural uh, staging important? Because lots of lymphatic channels in the with the plural area, even very low uh, tumors T actually they can involve in the plural. They have a match to the brain without lymph nodes effect. So it means that the visceral prora <coughs> staging is very important because you have, uh, usually visceral prora have uh, two layers uh, of the lamina, right? The internal, external, based on the defini uh, def definition, how can you determine visceral prora if you do <coughs> elastin staining? You have to say the tumor invading to outer layer of uh, elastin, not like internal elastin involved. Also, also emphasize that uh, I did the uh, elastin staining, I still couldn't determine. You have to take back don't overcall. That's basically <coughs> the last uh, version of the AJCC service edition emphasized that actually. That's kind of, you have, you have to have uh, evidence. So right now basically kind of because we kind of uh, emphasize about the plural invasion, right? We got the case from the different institutes. Also every case where do, they do elastic staining. But it's not necessary, right? This is like a tumor, like a lipid growth pattern. Do you say there's a plural? No support, no invasion. You don't need to do elastic staining. Right, so there will be no like a pro visceral plural invasion. How about this case? Do you say this tumor, like a solid growth pattern, this is a plural, right? Visceral plural. I think the resident ink, I usually don't ink this plural. This is not a margin, it's not useful. But uh, you ink is okay. So do you see this is, do you think it's a visceral plural invasion or not? Right? So without a staining, probably very tough. But when you grow, it's probably, I grow, so you say, resident say, grow a popped area. If you pop the area, make sure you actually represent a truly popped area. That uh, most likely it's a <coughs> visceral plural invasive component there, right? So if you do the elastin stain, did you see this tumor, right? Like invading through this lamin, like a elastin like positivity here, then you have tumor here. This is the original tumor 1.8 center because the plural invasive, invasive yes, you would say upgraded T2A, right? So that's kind of important too. So then talk about, uh, yeah, or I already emphasized about uh, staging of the tumor based on the invasive components. Also, radiology, you say ground glass, usually they consider this is adenocus, lipid growth pattern. If they say semi-solid component, they consider this invasive component, right? So if they think about, so when you do something, basically think about this is an imaging study, because why the surgeon 
kind of, uh, they send the uh, frozen section to you. Oh, this is the most like a radiology finding, say, uh, like a ground glass, and most likely will be adding a calcium site to you. Can you look at the frozen? But certainly, say, oh, you cannot, like, say, tell me, but uh, that uh, ground glass gave you some impression this most likely may be adenocarcinoma in situ. But if you go to the radiology literature, actually, they can't diagnose the adenocarcinoma in situ right now. So I think all based on the definition, if uh, radiology consider, uh, if everybody consider adenocarcinoma in situ, that kind of pattern, probably you consider adenocarcinoma in situ, right? So that, that is, I already show you, this is one 2.1 centimeter of tumor. You have little invasive 0 0.2 centimeter. That's basically you have T1 minimally invasive cancer stage. Don't based on 2.1 centimeter stage, right? So you don't overstage in this patient, right? This is a probably nine centimeter tumor with this 1.1 centimeter. So you yeah, don't based on this is a very large component, lipid growth pattern, or based on this invasive component to do staging, right? So yeah, as you can see, the eight centimeter mass, you have 1.1 centimeter. So this is actually T1B lesion. Before, actually, right now you say if you consider a centimeter, because more than seven centimeter will be T4, this patient will have a radiation or like a therapy, right? But right now, basically, you stage in T1B, this patient don't do that. Actually, this is a very older case, five years ago, the patient. So originally that time, actually, T3 lesion because tumor more than seven centimeter. But actually, T1B, the patient is five years, still like a negative lymph node has survived very good. So this one is a very small tumor nodule. Did you see this is a 1.1 centimeter nodule? But uh, you do have a lipidic growth pattern here, but you have to subtract a lipidic growth pattern, 0 0.2 centimeter. Say this patient 1.1, so like a subtract 0 0.2, have 0 0.9 centimeter. So only 0 0.9 centimeter invasive components. You do have some called Moyola component attack picture. This actually TD1 nephson can be positive too. So we we'll talk about if you have the bigger growth pattern, you have more important nodules, <coughs> invasive component. What are you to do? So this case, like a 3.8 centimeter, right? It's a ground glass pattern, right? A little, probably little, little there, here, solid components. So based on the base that the suggestion from like AJCC, you have say give the rough rate percentage of the individual invasive components, right? Add up then time the mm, mm, largest. Uh, kind of a tumor size. This is calculated 0 0.87 centimeter, right? Still kind of a, a very small lesion to stage in the patient. So this one basically is an actually uh, one assistant professor actually in my UCL, we wrote the uh, book chapter for me medical oncologist. How exactly to, 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 to staging of the patients? So before actually we based on seventh edition, like eighth, eighth edition just came actually we totally changed it, we revised again for this book chapter. So as you can see, this is, you have, you have several potentials in the more than two nodules, right? Or the two separate tumors, two different morphology. One is squamous, one is adena. Well, this is easy. So this is a two separate tumor stage. But when you have the multiple lipidic growth patterns of the tumor, you have to think about uh, separate tumor staging. So they will say, well, why do you know so this is a lipid growth pattern, not from that uh, spot spread out to another one? We exactly do not have a scientific data for that. But uh, you can do, oh, somebody said, let's do EGFR, KRAS, mutation studies. Can you say? Yeah, maybe it's suggestive. It's not a 100% for sure. So this is a one more tumor. But based on the definition, all like a lipid growth pattern tumor, tumors with any invasive component, this you have separate staging. Because the patient could be have uh, AH. Now based on the theory, as AH, adiocarcinoma in situ, then go to invasive components. That means the patient will develop, you have tumor here, then another lobe. Maybe a couple of years, they will have another tumor. Basically consider like a, a separate tumor. Uh, yeah, another tumor, pneumonic type adenocarcinoma, that's usually very like a single tumor, probably there, here, is a connected. And then you have a separate tumor nodules, basically consider like interpulmonary metastasis. We believe if you have a similar morphology, we consider one tumor private meds from one tumor to another one. So this is a, a imaging show you kind of a pneumonia pattern. They treat, treat the patient with antibiotic, biotics, a needle called biopsy, but it's not. So this is, I think it's a good approach actually I learned from UCLA now. So this is basically when I assign a needle called biopsy, uh, you have a radiologist imaging, right? We have a pulmonary uh, pathology diagnosis. 
we have a particular area due correlation. So radiology will consider this is your diagnosis representative of a tumor or not. So basically, if we say, oh, this is not, uh, not a representative tissue, or they consider it's negative, suppose positive, so they are doing another needle core biopsy. We have kind of programmed this one. That's, I think, very nice. So actually, diagnosis is uh, uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma. So they did that kind of lobectomy. So whole big tumor, right? Usually, this kind of mucinous tumor, you have main, like a tumor, then you have little satellite nodule. Based on that, but if this is a very small tumor, you have small nodule, you think, you think it's a T3, right? But this tumor is very huge, it's more than 7 centimeters, you have to stage in T4, right? So if this is not like tumor very small, then you have set of nodules in one lobe, that's a T3, right? You consider one tumor. So today you have this patient, I quickly say patient have a, a larynx cancer, then have lung squamous cell carcinoma as well. So they did the procedure before, then they have another tumor nodule in the lung. So, so in economic decision, this is a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma or a de novo, like a primary squamous cell carcinoma, right? So, so I, as you can see, this is all sexy easy. See, this is all invasive component, right? So then you have to think about this potentially kind of uh, de novo squamous cell carcinoma. Look harder to say airway. This is airway, right? Some you have uh, squamous metaplasia, then do squamous cell carcinoma inside too. But you have this squamous cell carcinoma inside too, you, you can say, oh, this is a squamous cell carcinoma de novo tumor, it's not metastatic tumor. That's important for the patient, the clinical outcome for treatment. If the two separate tumor nodules, similar morphology, right? This is a small nodule, but it's the main tumor, but the morphology pretty kind of similar, right? We have to consider this is intrapulmonary metastasis. The staging will be, T3 instead of based on main tumor 3.5 centimeter because you have a, another nodule metastatic to the 3.5 centimeter tumor. So certainly well, if you have two different patterns of tumor, let's say this is a very solid, you have little S in the pattern, but this is micropapery, papery, then you have, oh certainly this is two different tumors, right? It was two different tumor staging to uh, of this patient, where B T one B and T two A, right? So this is a, I would say this is T2A with the final, like advanced stage of the patient. But uh, you do have, I uh, emphasize about a lipid growth pattern, then we have individual invasion, invasion, so actually two separate tumors. So if you don't say consider one is mad to another one, you have to sub, sub, uh, stage in separately. You have the like T1A, then you say T1B, we usually give the nodes T1B like two separate lesions. It's a very lower staging of the patient. So summary, basically, so you have to consider histological features, uh, immunostain for classifiers of the lung cancer. Uh, immunostain in nowadays play very important rules, particularly when you cannot tell the morphology, right? So oh, say a glandular differentiation, so, etc. Then you have to think about, I cannot think about any tumor put in the WH classification. Think about the other tumors. Uh, could I do uh, additional markers or molecular tests to subclassify this tumor? So it's important. Then staging basically emphasize again, you have give the tumor total size, then give the invasive components that is important for two staging. Then give, they say, two different nodules, think about, talk to the surgeon, talk to medical uh, 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 oncologist, you know, you have to staging in the same board because the treatment will be different based on our experience. Morphology is very important to make a diagnosis as well. So I didn't cover some like molecular studies, probably kind of uh, you guys do the same thing, EGFR, ELK, ras one particularly like PDL one now a pretty hot topic. So yeah, actually it was, yeah, lots of res prior residents, they are already attending, some fellows, actually Fa Chen, actually my long time collaborator. So some authors maybe I did not mention in my talk. Thank you very much. question to you is about the New York institution. How often does the pathologist um, see a frozen section where a, a, a surgical decision is going to be based on their diagnosis, whether it is they are going to do a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy, and how often do uh, your pathologists consult in frozen section with the lung pathologist? 
Yeah. The, like, uh, just based on the experience I had in, at UCLA, right, we have three thoracic surgeons, actually. Only one very credit Dr. Uh, Cameron. I don't probably, you guys know him. Uh, he basically, if clinically, without a prior frozen, di uh, like a needle core biopsy. Yeah. So if, an, if like, the needle core biopsy called a bit gross pattern, they may ask, say, do you think it's an invasive component there? How <coughs> much percentage, how big, more than 0 0.5 centimeter or not? So we do our best, okay? At this point, so usually they will ask a pulmonary pathologist <coughs> if we are available, also <coughs> if before 5 p.m. Usually after 5 p.m., we usually don't take a consultation, but if we say we are wrong, we still can do it. So majority cases, they will ask us to look at because we are finalized report. So because they don't say, oh, that's not my responsibility, like if you create some discrepancy, because we are going to discuss with uh, surgeons. Mm -hmm. Neil? Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have two, I have many questions, but only two. Just one, just, just maybe a short one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so first of all, do you see any use for Maxime to be used in conjunction with here one for biopsy specimens uh, for staining? Because I would personally, since Maxime is driven by TTF1, there would be extremely rare cases where Maxime would be positive in the absence of TTF1. And we can say more tissue. Yeah. The second, the second question is: Do we use PDL1 at your institution as part of um, reflex testing? What's that? What's that? Maybe, 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 maybe uh, you, you can talk to him and just, uh, just yeah. we'll talk to him individually. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. Uh, one question about PDL1 absent A because uh, based on our studies, <laughs> like a poorly differentiated tumor, right? If you use a target 10% actually can pick up. TDF1 negative, that's an it can pick up. It's not like right. It doesn't right. So usually adding a carcinoma is TDF1 kind of positive. If you need a core biopsy, I usually do some staining. Even typical patterns of lung adding a carcinoma because some weird case may be metastatic. So from my philosophy, I usually need a core biopsy. I usually even do TDF1 and that's an it together in case. Because clinical imaging, when they may not study quite well, you can get a one nodule, or long nodule, or something, the other case is metastatic. Maybe 99% you're right, only 1% are not right. But I usually to do two things, in ground or whatever. Probably waste a little money, but uh, you feel more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.